May the grace of God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with, be with you all. You know, we have kind of addressed that, that whole thing about calling. To be called uh, is, is not just that you make a choice. To be called speaks to identity. It's who I am. It's, it's what I'm about, uh, even as a Christian. And today we get to, to this uh, text about being called uh, for fellowship. And it's an intriguing thing. Paul has uh, written uh, two letters that we have, probably four letters in total, to a church with which he struggled quite a bit, a church with a lot of pride, a church with a lot of kind of uh, excessive kind of ways of approaching a lot of things. And he ends the last uh, letter that, that we have with this. Just after he said all kinds of things, he says, okay, so... May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and of all the things he could have said, the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. I, I doubt that there are many things that have more importance for our lives as, as human beings than the word fellowship. We are created for fellowship, if you will. We are communal beings. If we as human beings, we are communal beings. And, and one of the things we, we know, unless we walk around with kind of eyes closed and ears shut, we, uh, we realize that we now are living through a, a, an urgency of a crisis of mental illness like we have not seen it in, in generation. And everyone who writes about that, everybody who is studying that, they bring it back to isolation. It always comes like that. If You know, one of the great books that have come out lately by Jonathan Hyatt is, is called The Ancient uh, Generation. And you'll see a lot of stuff going there. But if you think about it a little bit, you, we used to feel sense of a community, right? And, and then came, of course, uh, this, this emphasis in the 70s. It kind of began, it budded up, and it had just grown ever since. A philosophy we call postmodernism. And what postmodernism did is that they said, well, we don't really have a narrative that we live as part of. We're not really a part of, of a, a nation or a group or a people or, or a story, really. We are individuals primarily, so there's no grand story we all kind of listen to and live into. We're just me, you know, be you. Uh, just, you know, find your own kind of way regardless of what anything and all things says. And then you add to that what began, I guess, as late as 2007. Some of you are thinking that was yesterday. I know that, right? <laughs> When the phone came out, the iPhone came out, and it could isolate ourselves. You know, it began earlier. Of course, I didn't realize that. You, some of you had several TVs, right? And so you could begin to kind of not sit together, watch the same stuff, right? And then came the phone, and, and before long, you were having dinner at the same table, but nobody looked at each other. You looked at the phone. So you had a relationship with the screen and not with people. Right? And you see that, and it develops, and so it's then came COVID, and then came isolation in an even stronger way. And here comes Paul. Here comes Scripture. Here comes God. And he says, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, and may the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Now, something very powerful about this, if you haven't found it, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. This is kind of, uh, I used to, every church uh, I, I pastor full time, I would end the service with that blessing, asking for these three things. Not only did it highlight who God is as the Trinity, but it it's emphasized the key points of the Christian faith. And one of those is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We don't just choose fellowship. Fellowship is a call. It's part of the calling of being Christian. And if it is true about people in general, uh, our, our need for community, our need for fellowship, it is true of the Christian uh, in, in particular. You know, the church began as a call to gathering. 
You know that, right? So when you see in the, the flow of Scripture, the whole thing, in, in, you know, everything went haywire. Uh, you, you saw that in chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel, which kind of functions now, that story as a parable of what we experience now, uh, that, that everything was scattered. People were scattered. They didn't understand each other anymore. Everything was kind of divided. They just went their own ways where before they could have been together. And then comes Pentecost that transforms all of that and brings everything together. Are you hearing this? The fellowship of the Spirit overcomes isolation. This is what this whole thing is all about. It is the fellowship of the Spirit, the outpouring of God's Spirit that empowered us and enabled us to come together where that was impossible before. You know, where Jews and Gentiles could not sit together, now they can sit together by the power of the Spirit. Where, where slaves could not be with masters, by the power of the Spirit, they are now sitting together. Men, uh, male, female, different kinds of, some groups of all kinds are now together. I hope you hear this. You seeing this? It, it is the power of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring, if you will, of the Holy Spirit that enables us to anticipate that these things can actually happen. That is what has made it possible for people that are not unitable to be united. That is what, what made it possible for people and groups that are conflicted to no longer be conflicted. That is what makes it possible for even individuals who may be conflicted with themselves to come together as a person themselves, if you will. It is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that has made it possible for sinful people to now join and have fellowship with God Almighty. More than that, even for them to experience a daily life-giving, life-invigorating power of God's presence. It is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that has allowed a fellowship with God that made it possible for people no longer to ever feel like they are outside of fellowship. Are we getting this? I don't mean that we understand it with our brains. I trust we do. We're not dense. But are we getting it in the bottom of your heart? Are you understanding that you cannot live the Christian life without a keen awareness of the importance of the fellowship of the Spirit. You know, it's kind of a thing, fellowship of the Spirit. That is both the fellowship that the Spirit creates here, right, and the fellowship with the Spirit himself. And Holy Spirit and fellowship is so closely tied in, in, in Scripture that, that, that this becomes a key notion throughout. Paul repeats it again and again and again, and Jesus is referring to it also. When, when the Spirit is taken out, he, please hear this, friends, not just with your ears but with your heart. When the Spirit is taken out, fellowship as we know it becomes mere social gatherings. It's a shame in many ways that churches, their fellowship hall is primarily a place to eat pizza together. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that is not the deepest point of, of, of fellowship. When there's mere social fellowship, people of the same kind gather, right? When you have social fellowship only, it is people that have the same kind of amount of, of, of wealth or income, if you will. They, they find these other people who have the same ideas. They find these other people who have the same interests. They find each other. People who belong to the same political parties and have the same convictions on that find each other. People that have the same age find each other. All of that is broken down by God's Spirit, so that when you come to the fellowship of the Spirit, young and old, rich and poor, black and white, different kinds of opinions of all kinds sit next to each other in the pew. Yes? Because there's something higher, stronger, better than just mere social togetherness, and that is the fellowship of the Holy 
spear. What seems to be impossible for the world is possible in Christ. And I need you to see this, this phrase, fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That phrase is in Greek as, as strong as it is in English, it may be stronger, right? So it, it carries two senses. And it does in English too. Fellowship, and I mentioned it before, right? Fellowship of the Spirit is on the one side the, the fellowship that is created by the Spirit. We know that sometimes with songs, right? Uh, the Spirit is in this place, right? Uh, let us be flooded by that and know the atmosphere, right? Or the old song, same way, right? We know that there's a Spirit in this place, and we know what? That it is the Spirit of the Lord. We understand that. The other side of that is this fellowship we have with the Spirit. The Spirit himself, that which means that these things are not two separate things. I have the Holy Spirit fellowship here, me and the Holy Spirit, and then we have another fellowship that the Holy Spirit creates. These are the same thing, just two sides of it. You can't have one without the other. The fellowship that the Holy Spirit creates is created between and among people that walk with the Spirit, so to speak. The fellowship of the Spirit is the prerequisite to live the Christian life with power, with energy, and with victory. And I need us to see, friends, that this is not just a theoretical sentence, like we believe other things, right? Since I have the Christian confession, I must also have the Spirit. That's kind of what the Bible teaches, and I know that in my head. No, the Bible never speaks like that. The Bible always speaks about the presence of the Spirit as a living, vital relationship that can be experienced. Just like you experience other relationships. That is also why Christians in Scripture are encouraged not ever to quench the Spirit. They are, they are mandated, so to speak, uh, or certainly encouraged strongly to not grieve the Spirit that he may withdraw his presence. Please hear this. If you're thinking, I don't know about this. What is the practical kind of consequence of me actually experiencing the presence of the Spirit? as reality. And the answer is this, much in every way. The fellowship with the Spirit is what gives you insight into God's will. It, it is what illuminates God's words when you read it. It is what speaks, allows you to hear his voice when he speaks to your soul. But it's also the power, the power to do that will. So if we look at that really quick, in terms of insight that the fellowship with the Holy Spirit gives, you know, I think what we all know is there's anything we want, anything we struggle for, it is to know the direction for our lives. Who, I, who am I? What am I supposed to do about life? And there are so many things going on with this. Every one of us is bombarded by thousands of decisions that need to be made every day. We know it, right? Some of that mundane, right? Some of you can spend way too much time thinking about where should I have my lunch today? That shouldn't take a second. Just go to the first place, whatever. Right? <laughs> or what shirt should I wear? You know, we spend time. But there are lots of decisions that come our way all the time. Which education should I choose? Which, which group of friends should I hang with? Well, what, what person should I decide to live the rest of my life with? 
How do I find the right kind of a job position? What, what do I do? There? How do I raise my kids? And, and, you know, what are the consequences for my testimony when I make this decision as opposed to that decision? How do my kids experience the way they see me do things? Lots of decisions all the time. And how do we sort all these things? Well, they bombard us hour by hour again and again. Well, we can't if we're just left to our own little kind of two plus two is four. But Christian people have the advantage of being able to get insight into God's will. Those who are moved by his spirit in our heart and those who kind of recognize the fellowship that his spirit gives in our daily lives will also come to know the revelatory power because we can recognize his voice when he speaks. You, you know, those of you who know scripture, many of you may not have studied it that closely, but those of you who have, will know Paul sometimes says, on this particular t- issue, I don't have a word from Jesus or from the Lord. In other words, there's nothing he can quote from that. But I too have the Spirit. In other words, he recognizes, had Jesus spoken on this, that's what he would have said. And so just think about this for a moment. Scripture says also that no one can know the depth of another person. The only one who can know the depths of a person is the spirit of that person. You can look it up, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And then he goes on in the next verse and he says, the same is true with God. No one can know the depths of God except the spirit of God. Are we getting this? And now he says, you can come to know that through the fellowship of his spirit. Imagine that. Imagine that. I hope you're listening here, that you, through the fellowship of his spirit, which is a call, which should be the identity of you as a Christian, you can come to know the depth of God's will for your life. And hear me here. We, we sometimes get lost, I'm afraid, in, in theological stuff where we just say, well, you know, I have a Christian confession and, and therefore I have the Spirit. Every time this, the Bible speaks about the relationship with Spirit, it's always a dynamic relationship. That's why you can talk about quenching it and, 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 and uh, grieving the Spirit. It, it's not an either or so much. It it, it is a more or less. It it is just like any relationship. It can be warm. It can be close. It can be intimate. Or it can be cold and distant and put on ice, if you will. The call here is for you to strive, long for, desire to have a close walk with God's Spirit. That's an opportunity that God gives to you. Think about it. Just let your mind run through this for a moment. That the one who has created you, the one who blew the breath of life into your nostrils, the the one who holds your future and your very life in the palm of his hand. He says, I want to have an intimate relationship with you so that you can come to have a new understanding, even new dimensions in your understanding of who you yourself is, but also of how his will works in your life. 
Are we getting this? This is not light stuff, friends. Much easier to talk about than to live into. But that's the call. The Holy Spirit is what gives you also the power to do his will, not just to understand it and know it, but to do it. There's hardly any kind of context in Scripture where that does not come up, right? And, and it's again and again. And, and the Bible says, for example, when, when you don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit with power will intercede with you or for you with the Father. The Holy Spirit with power will grant you the gifts needed for you to do the ministry he has called you to do. The, the, the Holy Spirit with power will, will give you spiritual insight and spiritual power to overcome the temptations that come your way. It, it will allow you to uh, get into even spiritual warfare and come out victorious. It is the power of the Spirit that that allows you to pray and to pray with faith for someone to experience divine healing. We see it again and again and again. The Bible is eager to kind of show us the context and the connection between actual fellowship with God's Spirit and fellowship with other people and ability to live the life God has called us to live with power and with victory. I want to just mention a couple of things. You, most of you know the Apostle Paul how he went through all kinds of things. And in Philippians, there's just a few pages after this. He said, you know, I try to have everything. I try to have nothing. I try to be hungry. I try to be full. I can do it all through Christ. <coughs> but if you flip just one page back here, Paul kind of highlights, and it just comes right before what he just says here about the grace of Christ, our Lord the love of God, and the fellowship of the Spirit. He talked like this, you know, I've been struggling, I've been toiling. And, you know, go to verse, verse chapter, chapter 11 here, right? And, and he's saying here, I was, I was five times receiving 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spend a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I face dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers, go figure, toils and hardship and struggle, uh, may many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food. I was freezing cold and without clothing, not to mention, and all above all of these things, my deep concern for all the churches, that is, people around, that they would withstand and they would live with the fellowship of the Spirit, so to speak. Who is weak if I'm not weak? Who does not burn in him to just give up and say, enough is enough? So you ask, why? Where did Paul find that kind of power to continue to risk everything to show how the fellowship of the Spirit can generate all kinds of things, new communities everywhere? He knew it came from his fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Did Paul wish that he didn't have to do that and he could just snap his fingers and it was all over? Absolutely, that's what he just said. But he knew life is not like that. We need God's presence, friends. You all have pressures. You all have issues. Everyone faces difficulties beyond. We're not sure how to act. We, we, we want to be able to sit with those that are completely different from us. 
whether it has to do with, you know, economic situation, or has to do with racial situation, has to do with ethnic groups, has to do with, with political views, has to do, we want to see God do his work. Yes? Paul faced this day in and day out. And he ends that letter that he wrote Remind them of the call, the identity that comes with being a Christian, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, koinonia is the word, which refers not to pizza sharing, but to sharing of life, depth, of reality. It's the kind of same word that is used many times for marriages. It's used for people who sell everything they have and get started business together. That kind of deep, unbreakable fellowship. The koinonia of the Spirit. I'm not even sure how I should, I'm supposed to end this. So let me just ask you. Is that not what you need? Is that not what we need? It sure is what I need. I know that. If God is speaking to you, friend, don't just say, okay, I heard that. I've heard a thousand sermons. React. Paul says you should strive for the gifts, the greater gifts. That is to strive for a close and intimate relationship with the Spirit. That's our focus. When that becomes reality, all other things will fall into place one by one.